Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Sabbath. So let us begin with a word of prayer. Our glorious Father in heaven, we are just thankful, Lord, for your presence with us. We ask now for your spirit to be upon us. Lord, we pray that you will not allow the devil to distract or harass us in any way uh, during this time, this special time, but that we may be tuned in uh, to you and that we may learn of you. I pray that I will be hidden in you, Lord, and that your words will be conveyed and spoken and not mine. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we've been going through the Sabbath, kind of following it through the Bible, but this morning we're going to take a little pause for that. This is a uh, subject that came up a few weeks ago, um, as I was talking with somebody, and I, I, there's probably somebody here, I assume, who maybe needs to hear this or understand it that maybe didn't before, um, and, and it makes uh, a big difference in how we understand things as we go forward studying the Bible. So this morning the, the topic is rightly dividing um, the word of truth. And our scripture reading for this morning was 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. If you could turn there with me. 2 Timothy chapter 2 in the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 15, and Paul writing to Timothy, he said, Be diligent. I still hear pages turning. I'll pause for a moment. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we need to rightly divide the word. So when we read the Bible, are we to take everything that we read as being literal? No. 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 Hopefully we're all on the same page there. So how do we know what to take as literal and what needs additional interpretation? And how do we go about interpreting that which needs additional interpretation? When we come to something in the Bible, that says, the Lord did such and such, or the Lord acted in a certain way, or expressed a certain emotion, is it always to be taken literally? To begin with this morning, I'd like us to look at the experience of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. So if you'll turn back to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 21. So this is occurring when <coughs> Moses has been in the wilderness. He's seen the, uh, the burning bush and the Lord has come to him and told him, I want you to go back to Egypt. And as he's had these interactions and Moses has put up his objections, and the Lord has told him, look, here's these uh, miraculous things. I'm, I'm showing you that I will be with you and you know, we'll be able to work this out. They're having this conversation, and this is verse 21 of chapter 4. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you will see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. So that seems rather straightforward, right? The Lord said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Then as we read the, the following chapters, we see the experience of Aaron and Moses going back. They meet with Pharaoh. Uh, they have the interaction with the magicians, and he throws his rod down, and they throw their rods down, and his rod eats their rods, and then the plagues come, and one, two, three, four, all the way through 10. And as we follow that through, these are the statements that we find made in Exodus chapter 7. It says, Pharaoh's heart grew hard, 
and he did not heed them, meaning the, the, what he was being told to do, as the Lord had said. And then the next verse, it says, the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. A couple verses later, it says, Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. Neither was his heart moved by this. Then the next chapter, chapter 8, it says, But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, the Lord had withdrawn the plague that was there, he hardened his heart. So Pharaoh hardened his own heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. And then a couple verses later, it says, Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. This was in relation to the lice. They weren't able to reproduce lice. And so they said, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had said. A few verses later, But Pharaoh hardened his own heart at this time also. Neither would he let the people go. The next chapter, chapter 9. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. And then a couple of verses later, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and it did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. And then a few verses later, Pharaoh sinned yet more, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants. And then the very next verse says, so the heart of Pharaoh was hard, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. And then over in 1 Samuel chapter 6, this is where the Philistines have the ark of God and they've ended up having some disease process occurring and they're saying, hey, we've got to get rid of the ark of God. Their priests tell the leaders, why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? So their understanding was Pharaoh and the Egyptians hardened their own hearts. So when we look at all of these, the Lord said, I'll harden Pharaoh's heart. Then it says, Pharaoh's heart grew hard. The Lord said, Pharaoh's heart is hard. Pharaoh's heart grew hard. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Pharaoh's heart grew hard. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. The heart of Pharaoh became hard. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. The heart of Pharaoh was hard. And the Philistines say the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts. So who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Right? Did the Lord force Pharaoh to harden his heart? Did Pharaoh choose to harden his own heart? Could Pharaoh harden his own heart if he didn't have the freedom of choice? No. So how is it that Pharaoh had freedom of choice? We all do, right? It's a gift of God. We only have freedom of choice because God gives us the freedom of choice. In Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In many and various ways, God spoke to our forefathers. So God always speaks to men through ways and means that are understandable to them. So what do we know about Pharaoh and the Egyptians when it comes to religion? Well, we know that they use magic as a part of their religion, and their worship of their gods. In fact, throughout the ancient world, magicians were important members of royal courts. The people believed that magic was a means by which power could be transferred from the gods to human beings. Magicians were well-educated individuals, and they had studied the incantations and actions that were needed to cause gods or demons to honor human requests. Their official services were needed for many things, but foremost was for understanding the will of the gods. Now, Egypt's magical traditions are the best known to us of all the ancient world. And this is partly because other civilizations were very impressed by the Egyptian traditions, but mostly because of the wealth of Egyptian magical texts that have survived in the desert all these years. The Egyptian magical texts extend from the third millennium BC all the way to the end of the Roman Empire. These texts include incantations, amulets, secret signs, certain geometric shapes, acrostic word patterns, and the names of famous individuals. Now, in the book of Exodus, Moses is presented as directing the plagues in the same manner as the Egyptians understood their magic to work. Through the miracles demonstrated, Moses conveyed the power of his God to the Egyptians 
in a way that they could understand and relate with. The Egyptian magicians, however, were engaged in the same enterprise. When they turned rods into snakes and water into blood or called frogs out of the Nile, well, they believed it was the power of their gods who were working for them. As a result, Pharaoh's magicians were unimpressed with Moses and his god as long as they were able to replicate the same tricks with their magical arts. But when they couldn't produce lice, the Egyptians expressed their admiration for Moses with the words, this is the finger of God. This utterance, this is the finger of God, this is actually an Egyptian magical phrase. In this way, the Egyptian magicians acknowledged that Moses' God was greater than their gods. So the thought process of the Egyptians and the ancient cultures in general went like this. If I'm in charge of you, well then my God is bigger and better than your God. And if we go to war and I win, well, my God is more powerful than your God. That's the only reason why we would end up winning. So did this thought process, the way that the Egyptians thought about gods and their interactions with humans, did that affect the Israelites and their thoughts about their God and his interactions with humans? After all, the Israelites had been in Egypt for 400 years. How old is the United States? Just, just under 250 years. So think about, we've only been here 250 years. They were there 400. How much influence did the Egyptian thought process have on the Israelites? Well, as we see in Exodus 15, we find the Song of Moses and Miriam. And it's a victory song just like those sung in many cultures in the ancient world. God is praised as a mighty warrior going out to fight for Israel. In the mindset of the ancient world, armies didn't go to battle alone. The deity or deities of the army fought in heaven and on earth against the opposing army and its gods. Nearly every single culture had a deity of war. All the gods who were responsible for a particular city were expected to be able to defend their territory. Otherwise, how good of a god were they? So Israel's god, bringing his people out of Egypt, is depicted in song as having defeated the army, and thus also the gods, of the Egyptians all by himself. Now, the use of water to destroy enemies is also ancient. There are songs about the defeat of the Sumerian city of Ur earlier in the uh, second millennium BC that tell about floods and roaring rivers that are sent by the gods to destroy the city. In Israel's song, God picks up chariots and riders and he throws them into the water as if they were mere toys. The language, the symbols, and the imagery of Israel's song are those commonly used for war deities in the ancient world. Israel's enemies, near and far, are terrified according to the song. Terror or fear was assumed to be a separate substance which went before the deity, defeating enemies even before the god arrived on the scene. The people of the victorious deity are then established in their proper place, and the winning god is enthroned as ruler over the vanquished deities. So, the people and the nations around Israel would understand such phrases that were already familiar to ancient civilization. Thus, they would recognize the victory song of Moses and Miriam as praise for, the work, uh, praise for the work of a warrior deity who was mightier than any other deity. So think about the Egyptians and the Israelites having this same mentality. The bigger, better God destroys all of his opposition. If Jesus, meek and mild, had come to these people, both the Egyptians and the Israelites, bringing a message of love and introducing himself as the only true God who created the universe, he just happens to be appearing in human flesh, how do you think they would have responded based on their thought process? How receptive would they have been to his message of uh, love your enemy and Bless him. 
So with their mindset, if God had appeared to them as he really is, a God of love and compassion, would they have even responded? But did God want to reach these people and offer them salvation? Yes. Absolutely. So how is he going to have to communicate to reach them? What is it going to take for him to get their attention and impress them that they should listen to him? If he's going to be successful, he's going to have to communicate in a way that they would understand. But this type of communication that they're going to respond to is not God's preferred way to communicate. And it isn't who he really is. Could God come to these people with the still small voice and weep over them as he sat on a hillside and referred to himself as a mother hen? Would they have listened to that? Would they have understood what he really wanted to communicate to them? In order to reach both the Egyptians and the Israelites because of their mindset, the Lord had to approach them with thunder and lightning, earthquake, fire, plagues, a brute show of power and force. And he had to communicate as if he were angry, telling them what he hated and how he would destroy them if they didn't listen and obey. Is that how God really wants to communicate? Is that the language of heaven and who God really is? Or was God just meeting them where they were in a way that they would understand, even though it was not a true image of who he really is? Yet this same God allowed all of this to be recorded in the Bible as if that's who he is, even though that's not who he really is. What do you think of a God who is willing to do that? A God who is willing to condescend himself, come down and meet us where we are in a way that we can relate to, even though he runs the risk of being misunderstood in the process. Do you appreciate a God who would behave this way to try and save you and me? Does that demonstrate his love toward his children even if some of us end up misunderstanding him. But despite God demonstrating his power, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. In Christ's parable of the sower and the seed, there was no difference between the seed scattered in one kind of soil and that sown in the others, or even in the way that the seed was sown. Everything depended upon the type of soil. In like manner, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was in no way forced by God, but rather it was a deliberate choice by Pharaoh on his own part. By repeated warnings and displays of divine power, God sent light that was designed to point out to Pharaoh in a way that he could understand the error of his ways to hopefully soften and subdue his heart and to lead him to cooperate with God's will. But. With each successive manifestation of divine power, Pharaoh chose to be more and more determined to do just as he pleased. He refused to be corrected. He despised and rejected the light until he became insensitive to it. And the light was finally withdrawn. Thus, it was his own resistance to the evidence that was provided to him that hardened his heart. Pride prevented Pharaoh from acknowledging defeat. Even the heathen recognized the fact that it was Pharaoh and the Egyptians themselves who hardened their hearts and not God, as we read in 1 Samuel chapter 6. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart was evident first in the fact that he paid no attention to the demand of the Lord to let Israel go. His refusal to let God's people go was not restricted just to the plagues that the Egyptian magicians were able to imitate but he continued to refuse to let the people go, even when the magicians themselves acknowledged the plagues to be the finger of God. It also continued after the fourth and fifth plagues, which fell upon the Egyptians, but not upon the Israelites, a fact which the king was informed about. The hardening of his heart was demonstrated even more clearly when he broke his promise to let Israel go, on condition that Moses and Aaron would remove the plague and when he was forced to confess that he had sinned. 
Thus, when Moses was told before he ever reached Egypt that the Lord would harden Pharaoh's heart, God was referring to the continual refusal of Pharaoh to obey him and release the Israelites. Yet the scriptures record the words, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. God takes no pleasure in the suffering and the death of the wicked, but instead he desires that all repent and be saved. He causes his sun to shine upon the good and the evil. But the sun affects different materials in different ways, like it melts wax, as at the same time it hardens clay. The melting or the hardening occurs based upon the nature of the substance that the sun is shining upon. The sun just simply shines. So too, the influence of the thoughts of God upon the hearts of men produce different effects based upon the condition of the heart and the choice of the individual. The repentant sinner allows God's thought process to lead him to conversion and salvation, while the impenitent person hardens his heart more and more. The very same manifestation of the mercy of God leads one individual to salvation and life, and another to ruin and death, each according to his own choice. So here we have an example recorded in the Bible that says, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, but actually Pharaoh chose to harden his own heart. Thus we have to interpret beyond the literal surface reading of the words, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. God allowed events to occur, and he knew in advance how Pharaoh was going to respond to those events. Even though Pharaoh was going to respond negatively, the Lord still allowed the events to occur. Thus, the Lord knows it could be perceived that he is the one who hardened Pharaoh's heart. After all, God could have altered those events, but he didn't. So he allows it to be stated in the Bible that he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Our next illustration I'd like to look at is the death of King Saul. If you'll turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 10. In the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles chapter 10. We got Samuel, Kings, and then Chronicles. So 1 Chronicles chapter 10. So 1 Chronicles chapter 10, and beginning at verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons. And the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua, Saul's sons. The battle became intense against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was wounded by the archers. Then... Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and abuse me. But his armor-bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died. So Saul and his three sons died, and all his house died together. So how did Saul die? What, what happened? He committed suicide. So who killed Saul? Saul killed himself, right? So now we drop down to verse 13 of the same chapter. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore, he killed him. Who's the he? God. Well, now it says, therefore God killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. So who killed Saul? God allowed him to commit suicide, but God allows it also to be recorded as if he's the one who killed Saul. So we have another 
statement of God doing something that he didn't actually do because he allowed Saul to do it. I now would like to turn back and let's look at David and the numbering of Israel. So turn back to 2 Samuel. Oh, you guys are reminding me to move the clicker here. 2 Samuel chapter 24. Second Samuel chapter 24. Second Samuel chapter 24. So this is near the end of David's life. Second Samuel chapter 24 and verse 1. It says, Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. So right off the bat, it tells us God is angry, and therefore God moves David. So normally if I say I, that, that God moved somebody to do something, doesn't that sound like God kind of made them do it? God forced them to do it? God moved David to do this. Verse 2. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Now go throughout all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and count the people, that I may know the number of the people. And Joab said to the king, Now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundredfold more than they are, and may the eyes of my lord the king see it. But why does my lord the king desire this thing? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Job, uh, Joab and against the captains of the army. So Joab and the captains of the army went out from the presence of the king to count the people of Israel. I mean, you're in kind of a bad place when Joab has to be the one telling you what you're doing is wrong. If, you know, if you've read Joab and you know what he did, you've really got gone to a bad place. So verse 9, Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to the king. Skip all those numbers, jump to verse 10. And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Now when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and he said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or you got a third option. Shall there be three days' plagues in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time. From Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. And verse 17, Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Surely I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep... What have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. So as we would read this and just take it at face value, at the beginning, God is angry. And because God is angry, he makes David number Israel, which is a sinful thing. So God is making David do something that is sinful. David acknowledges what I've done is sinful. And then God says, okay, I was angry at you. I moved you to do this. Now you've sinned. Now I'm going to punish you on top of it, and I'm going to kill 70,000 people in the country. Is that not what it says at face value? Yeah. Could you not read that and come away with the conclusion that, well, this is who God is? God gets angry, and then he moves people to sin, and then he punishes them for sinning. But they didn't have a choice because he's God Almighty, and he moved them to do it. So 
keep your finger here in 2 Samuel 24 and turn forward to uh, 1 Chronicles once more. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. So 1 Chronicles chapter 21. So now, still got our finger at 2 Samuel 24, right? Yeah. Okay. So 2 Samuel 24, just to remind ourselves, says, Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them. And then we turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 21, and verse 1 says, now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. And then we have the exact same story repeated. But, but wait a minute, over here it says it was the anger of the Lord, but over here it says it was Satan. These scriptures are not contradictory, but simply represent two aspects of the same incident. Again, the Lord allows the Bible to state that he did something he didn't actually do. Throughout the Bible, God is frequently said to do that which he does not prevent. Here we have another instance of this. God also allows the biblical record to state that he is angry and that because of this anger, he caused David to sin. So this could lead people to believe that when God gets angry, well then he employs Satan to go and cause people to sin. But we have James 1, verse 13, that says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So when the Lord allows evil to have its way, the Bible often presents it as if this happened by the active participation of God, although it is actually the force of evil that is at work producing the results. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 728, part of this is word for word from it, and part of it is just the thoughts that are put together. Sometimes the Lord permits events to take their natural course and does not restrain evil. When parents or rulers neglect the duty of punishing iniquity, God himself will take the case in hand. His restraining power will be in a measure removed from the agencies of evil so that a train of circumstances will arise which will punish sin with sin. So who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Who killed King Saul? Who moved David to number Israel? In each one of these instances, the Bible says the Lord did it. So how do we make sense of all of this? And what do they tell us about God? God allows himself to be described as doing something that Satan actually did, but it was something that God did not prevent from occurring. So God accepts responsibility for the outcome and he allows the record to state that he did it. It's crucial to keep this in mind with everything that we read in the Bible. In some instances, God allows himself to be described in a way that isn't 100% literally accurate. As our text for the day says, we have to rightly divide the word of truth, having wisdom to know when something is literal and when something is not. So how can we rightly divide the word of truth? First of all, we have to pray before we study for the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and understanding. And we have to spend time with God, getting to know who he really is. We need to understand that part of who God is is his willingness to allow himself to be described as doing things he didn't actually do, and yet he's willing to accept the responsibility for it. The Lord allows this because nothing happens if he doesn't allow it to happen. We have this old saying, the buck stops with God, right? The buck stops with God. We also need to be aware that God allows himself to be portrayed as having human characteristics and emotions and reactions that don't entirely fit with agape love. Why would he do that? He does it 
to meet his people where they are and to communicate with them in a way that they can understand, even though on the surface, it's not always a completely accurate portrayal of who he really is. Another factor that is involved in this process is the thoughts and the ideas of the individual who is writing or recording the scripture. The Bible writers express ideas about God based upon their own culture and understanding. Remember, these writings were originally delivered to an audience that shared the same cultural background and had the same concepts and ideas as the writer had. Just as Moses led Israel through the wilderness no faster than they could follow, so God also met his children where they were, and he didn't lead them any faster than they could comprehend in revealing who he really is. He met them where they were, and he instructed them in a way that they could understand. Joe's here. If you were to go to a remote area of China that spoke no English, and you wanted to communicate with them, what language would you have to speak with the people there? Chinese, Chinese right? Why? What if you urgently needed to communicate to them about a life and death situation? Well, then what language would you use? Body language. Would you fall back to your native tongue? It would still be best to communicate to them in Chinese, because that's what they speak. I lost my spot on the page, hold on. So if you want to communicate effectively with them, would you have to relate to the customs and the ideas that those people are familiar with, as well as speak a language they can understand? Is that true? So what is the language of heaven? Love. Agape love. So is agape love the language that this sinful world speaks? No. It is not. So if the Lord comes to a people that don't speak his language, but he needs to communicate with them about a life and death matter, he's going to have to speak a language that they can understand. And he's going to use references to customs and ideas and emotions and behaviors that they can relate to. But that does not mean that those references or illustrations are always 100% exactly literal to who God really is? And do they even represent God's ideal preference for communication? We need to understand that God is limited by what those people can understand and what customs and ideas they can relate to. As we study the Bible and we look at it, where do we find the best representation of who God really is? the life of Jesus. So did Jesus demonstrate for the entire universe who God really is? Yes. Yes. Did he demonstrate God's preferred behavior and style of communication? So when the Bible talks about God exhibiting anger, wrath, vengeance, hatred, etc., we have to be very careful in how we interpret those statements. We should always look at who God actually is as represented by the life of Christ, keeping in mind that God allows himself to be described as doing things and behaving in ways that he doesn't actually do and behave. This occurs because God is trying to communicate with people where they are in a way they can relate to and using things they can understand. Our task is to rightly divide the word of truth and prayerfully discern when it is literal and when it is not. If we read about God doing something that is contrary to his character of agape love, we should always look to Jesus for clarification, seeking to understand how it makes any sense for a God of love who wants us to know him to behave the way that he is recorded as behaving in that particular situation and with those particular people. For our last example this morning, let's look at the story of Job. Turn with me to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. So right in the middle of your Bible should be Proverbs or Psalms, depending upon how many pages you've got. And the very book right before Psalm is Job. Job chapter 1. Psalm 
So Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. So Job is blameless, upright, he fears God, and he shuns evil. Does that sound like Job has a good relationship with God? Yes. Does it sound like he knows who God is? Yes. Okay. And then it tells us he had seven sons and three daughters, so he had ten children. And then it tells us he had all this wealth. And then in the next verse it tells us, in verse 4, that his sons would have feasts at their houses, and they'd invite their sisters over, and they'd all eat and drink together. And then verse 5 says, that so it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And thus Job did regularly. Sounds like a pretty good guy. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Would you like the Lord to say that about you? All right, that's a, that, that, they've got a good relationship. They know one another well. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Well, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in this land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So Satan himself is acknowledging, Lord, if you'll reach your hand out and touch it, as if the Lord was the one going to do the evil thing. And the Lord says to him, well, he's in your hand. You can go and do whatever you want. You just can't touch him. And then we see Job loses everything. A single day, children all killed. Property, wealth, all vanished. Stock market plunged. House destroyed. Everything gone in a day. And verse 21, this is Job speaking. Well, we can go to 20. Verse 20, then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshiped. And he, this is Job, said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. So Job, who has this great relationship with God, who knows God so well, in his perception, his understanding, what his culture had taught him was, well, if it's taken, it's because God took it away from you. He doesn't say Satan did this. God allowed it, he acknowledged, his concept is God took it away. And as we read through the rest of Job, we find basically his friends agree. This is all the thought process of the day. Their culture, that's what it taught, that was their concept. And thus it is recorded in the Bible as if that is so. So Job said God did it, his friends said God did it, but did God really do it? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. What does inspiration mean, that word? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Holy Spirit through man. But the, the literal word, inspiration. Not originating from motivate. The word inspiration means to motivate, to encourage, or to influence. So all scripture is given by the motivation of God, or all scripture is given by the influence of God. And then we have 2 Peter 1.21. For prophecy, prophecy not necessarily meaning prophecy of prophetic, something's going to happen in the future, but the communication of God to man. 
never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Right? So holy men of God spoke or communicated, wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So do we understand these verses to mean that the Bible was written by holy men who were under the influence of the Holy Spirit? Yes. yes. Okay. So can you tell me some of the holy men who wrote the Bible? John. John. Moses, Paul, Peter, David, Solomon. Have we looked at their lives? Would you, you know, as you watched Solomon putting his children on an altar and sacrificing them, would you say, there's a holy man of God? As David is killing off his best friend and sleeping with his wife, would you say, well, there's a holy man of God? Yet the Bible says, holy men. Now there's a discussion about, well, they were holy only at the moments when they had the reception of the uh, impression to write what they wrote. But when reading the Bible, we have to take into account who the individuals were that wrote the Bible. What was their understanding of what was happening during the period in which they lived? What cultural influences did they have on their ideas and how they communicated their message? Did they understand, uh, did their understanding impact how they expressed what happened and recorded it in the scripture? And why would God let them record things the way he did? Well, by God letting the Bible writers record things the way they did with their influences and their mindsets and their understandings, he is allowing us at this point to have a glimpse into the thought process of the people that he was dealing with at that time. This information helps us to understand why he dealt with them the way he did, why he communicated with them the way he did, and why they would state some of the things that they recorded, even things credited to God that he didn't actually do, like hardening Pharaoh's heart, killing Saul, being angry, and moving David to sin. So just because stories are recorded in the Bible, it doesn't mean the representation in those stories is exactly the way that God ideally wants to communicate or deal with things. However, it does show us that God is willing to meet us where we are, communicate and deal with us in a way we can understand, even if on the surface he ends up being portrayed in a light that isn't 100% accurate to who he really is. As we wrap up this morning, I'd like to look at some statements um, from Ellen White. I can't see the camera, are we okay there? The Bible is not given to us in grand superhuman language. Jesus, in order to reach man where he is, took humanity. The Bible must be given in the language of men. Everything that is human is imperfect. Am I standing in the way? Can everybody see over here okay? Yeah, you're good. Different meanings are expressed by the same word. There is not one word for each distinct idea. The Bible was given for practical purposes. The stamps of minds are different. People tell me my mind is different. All do not understand expressions and statements alike. Some understand the statements of the scriptures to suit their own particular minds and cases. And there's this word prepossessions, which in modern word would be presuppositions. Prejudices and passions have a strong influence to darken the understanding and confuse the mind, even in reading the holy words of writ. The Bible is written by inspired men, but it is not God's mode of thought and expression. It is that of humanity. God, as a writer, is not represented. Men will often say such an expression is not like God, but God has not put himself in words, in logic, in rhetoric, on trial in the Bible. The writers of the Bible were God's penmen, not his pen. Look at the different writers. It is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that were inspired. 
Inspiration acts not on the man's words or his expressions, but on the man himself, who, under the influence of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost, is imbued with thoughts. But the words and thoughts receive the impress of the individual mind. So his understanding, his cultural experience, he relates in how he expresses um, what he's expressing. There's other um, statements, I didn't put them in here, where Ellen White talked about her own experience, how she'd see things, but then it's up to her how she expresses that and writes it down. And so trying to describe, if I'm standing you know, right now seeing all of what I'm seeing, how do I put that into words to fully relay it to you so that you understand what it is I saw and doing the best I can with my understanding of how to express that in human language. The Lord gave his word in just the way he wanted it to come. He gave it through different writers, each having his own individuality, though going over the same history. Their testimonies are brought together in one book and are like the testimonies in a social meeting. They do not represent things in just the same style. Each has an experience of his own, and this diversity broadens and deepens the knowledge that is brought out to meet the necessities of varied minds. The thoughts expressed have not a set uniformity as if cast in an iron mold, making the very hearing monotonous. In such uniformity, there would be a loss of grace and distinctive beauty. The creator of all ideas may impress different minds with the same thought, but each may express it in a different way, yet without contradiction. The fact that this difference exists should not perplex or confuse us, right? One of the writers said God was angry, he moved David to sin, and the other one says Satan is the one who moved David to sin. It is seldom that two persons will view and express truth in the very same way. Each dwells on particular points which his constitution and education have fitted him to appreciate, right? His experience of life. The Lord speaks to human beings in imperfect speech in order that the degenerate senses, the dull earthly perception of earthly beings may comprehend his words. Thus is shown God's condescension. He meets fallen human beings where they are. The Bible, perfect as it is in its simplicity, does not answer to the great ideas of God. For infinite ideas cannot be perfectly embodied in finite vehicles of thought. The Bible points to God as its author, yet it was written by human hands. And in the varied style of its different books, it presents the characteristics of the several writers. The truths revealed are all given by inspiration of God, yet they are expressed in the words of men. The Infinite One, by His Holy Spirit, has shed light into the minds and hearts of His servants. He has given dreams and visions, symbols and figures, and those to whom the truth was thus revealed have themselves embodied the thought in human language. So this is now from Christ's Object Lessons. Merely to hear or to read the word is not enough, just a surface reading. He who desires to be profited by the scriptures must meditate upon the truth that has been presented to him. By earnest attention and prayerful thought, he must learn the meaning of the words of truth and drink deep of the spirit of the holy oracles. So we have to seek to really understand what was it really meaning, not just, well, it said God did this. Okay, God did it. God bids us fill the mind with great thoughts, pure thoughts. He desires us to meditate upon his anger and hatred. Oh no, it says love and mercy. To study his wonderful work in the great plan of redemption. Then clearer and still clearer will be our perception of truth. Higher, holier, our desire for purity of heart and clearness of thought. The soul dwelling in the pure atmosphere of holy thought will be transformed by communion with God through the study of scriptures. All who handle the word of God are engaged in a most solemn and sacred work. For in their research, they are to receive light and a correct knowledge that they may give to those who are ignorant. Education is the inculcation of ideas which are light and truth. Everyone who diligently and patiently searches the scriptures 
that he may educate others, entering upon the work correctly and with an honest heart, laying aside his preconceived ideas, whatever they may have been, and his hereditary prejudices at the door of investigation, will gain true knowledge. So there's a lot there. So to gain true knowledge, we have to diligently, patiently search. We have to enter the work correctly. We have to have an honest heart. We have to lay aside our preconceived ideas. We have to put aside our hereditary prejudices at the door. Then we can find true knowledge. The statement continues. I just had to break it into two uh, so everybody could see it. But it is easy to put a false interpretation on scripture, placing stress on passages and assigning to them a meaning which, at the first investigation, may appear true, but which, after further search, will be seen to be false. If the seeker after truth will compare scripture with scripture, he will find the key that unlocks the treasure house and gives him a true understanding of the word of God. Then he will see that his first impressions would not bear investigation. And that, and that continuing to believe them would be mixing falsehood with truth. May we not mix falsehood with truth. The Jews in Christ's day had been studying the scriptures, but they were not studying them correctly or allowing the Lord to reveal to them what he wanted to reveal. They were not seeing God who as, as who he is, because when Jesus showed up, God in the flesh, they did not recognize him. Instead, they rejected him. But they had been studying the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul writing, Paul says, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. That sounds to me like meeting people where they are and expressing things in a way that they can understand. And if Paul had that attitude, and he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I believe that is God's attitude. Hebrews 1, 1 tells us, it is in many and various ways that God spoke to our forefathers. Again, he had to meet them where they were and express things that they would be able to somewhat understand at that point in time. Paul says again, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but our goal is to see him face to face. Our goal, as John says, is to see him as he is. Who is God really getting to know him? And so as we do that, let us rightly divide the word of truth. My prayer this morning is that as we grow in our walk with the Lord, may we truly rightly divide the word of truth and not just take every single thing at a surface reading and go, well, it said, therefore, no, well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Study and, and, you know, as it says, prove all things. Our closing hymn this morning is 272, Give Me the Bible. Our Father in heaven, we are just thankful for your word, Lord. We thank you that you desire for us to understand, to know who you are, to enter into this experience and to be close, to be filled with your spirit so that we are changed, that we are molded and shaped and recreated in your image, that we may have your thoughts, your mindset, your approach, your attitude, your actions, Lord, that we may be a reflection of you. Father, we thank you that you desire to meet us where we are, to communicate in a way that we can understand. But we thank you that you sent Jesus to show us who you really are, that we may not have a misunderstanding, that we may not be misled. We thank you, Lord, that we've had this time this morning. We thank you for um, the freedoms that we are still enjoying in this country, that we can come here and worship together. Lord, we pray for this country. We pray for our leaders. We pray for the things that are going on. We just ask for your spirit to continue to work with those individuals who are receptive and responding. And we look forward to the days ahead as this world draws to a close and Jesus comes to take us home. Be with us as we go forward now. Keep us in your watch, Karen. May we glorify you in all things. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.